Good evening, everyone. How are you? Thank you so much for coming out tonight. How do we change the volume on this? Little too loud for our small, intimate group. I want to thank you guys for taking the time to come out tonight um, for, on the talk of revaluation. Um, it's not a, uh, not a very uh, uh, sexy talk to have, um, but I do appreciate you taking the time to come out to learn a little bit about the process and why we're doing it in the city. My name is Chris Huff. I am the city tax assessor for Portland. Um, however, in a revaluation year, that title is known to change to uh, public enemy number one. <laughs> um, before we get started, um, we do have some uh, refreshments in the back, water, um, some, uh, some cookies, and on the left table here are some brochures and some handouts. So we encourage you folks to take, um, to, to help yourself and to take uh, uh, whatever it is that you need. Um, some of the brochures back there um, will probably do a better job than I can in explaining the process to you. Um, so we are in the middle of a revaluation um, in, the, uh, in the city of Portland. Uh, as of today, we're a little past the halfway point of the revaluation project. And one of the questions that we get is why? Why are we putting everybody through the stress and the uncertainty of, of a revaluation process? And there's three um, very important reasons why we're, why we're doing this process. Um, and they, uh, those three reasons are really dictated um, by law. Maine Constitution says that while the public expenses are assessed on property, a general valuation should be taken at least once every 10 years. Does anybody know when the last revaluation was in the city of Portland? 15 years ago. 15 years ago, 2004. <laughs> ah, thank you, thank you. Uh, 2004 was the last time a revaluation was done in the city of Portland. We are well beyond that 10-year uh, uh, requirement. The Constitution also says that taxes assessed um, should be uh, done equally uh, according to just value. Just value means market value. What is the market value of a property? And when we're um, assessing taxes, uh, taxes should be assessed equally. They should be uniform. And having the last reval be 15 years ago, we are, our assessments currently are not equal. Um, and we're going to show you some statistics and some slides that, that illustrate that a little bit better. Maine revised statutes, uh, Title 36, which is the taxation chapter of Maine law, has two very specific standards that every municipal, uh, municipality has to uh, adhere to in their, in their valuations. The first is what's called an assessment to market value ratio. And what that means is, what is your assessed value at in relation to your market value, to your true market value? Um, law says that a municipality should have a minimum assess assessment ratio of 70% of its just value. Meaning that when you see an assessment, um, uh, in, a, in a good assessment, uh, a good, good process, you would be at 100%. Your assessment should reflect 100% of your market value. Um, if it falls below 70%, the state can take um, administrative actions against the municipality to get their level of assessments back um, to 100%. Currently, right now in the city, we are right at 70%. It's been 15 years since we've had a revaluation. Um, if we didn't do the revaluation uh, uh, currently, next year we would fall below that minimum standard of 70%. And the second standard that state law has is what's called a quality rating. This judges how equal, how equitable, how uniform assessments are. Um, quality rating is a much easier way than saying what the statistical measurement of this is, and it's called a coefficient of dispersion. And very simply, a quality rating or a coefficient of dispersion measures how far apart assessments are for similar properties. The, ma the maximum rating is 20, which basically symbolizes 20%. But what that means is two properties that are similar in style and type and uh, other attributes should not be assessed further than 20% apart from one another. Um, and you're going to see that our ratings in the city, we're at 18. We have a lot of inequity in our assessment system right now. Again, we haven't had a revaluation in 15 years. Um, so it's reasonable to expect that we would have a low value and a high inequity rating. And the purpose of a reval is to get us back on track to 100% and get everybody assessed equally. And that's really what the goals of, the reval of any revaluation is. Um, it's to implement new values for all properties to reflect 100% of market value as of, as of a specific date. 
our revaluation process, that date will be April 1st of 2020, next April. The valuation date in the state of Maine is every April 1st. Um, that's when uh, your, your tax bill that you, that you get each year is based on your value as of April 1st of that, of that, of that year. Um, so new values from this revaluation will take effect for April 1st of 2020, um, and that will impact tax bills that get mailed next uh, August, next, next September timeframe. Two other goals of a revaluation is to meet or exceed standards that are in place. The first standard is called USPAP, the Uniform Standards of Professional Appraisal Practice. Any licensed appraiser um, anywhere in the country has to follow USPAP standards when they do an appraisal project, when they do an appraisal report. And USPAP very specifically has standards for municipalities in mass appraisal um, in how to conduct it and what the standards should be. And then also uh, the IAAO, that's the Association of Assessing Officers, they have statistical standards that any municipality's uh, assessment should fall in. And I'll show you that in a slide in a little bit. Um, and you'll see that we are well outside of the standards that are set here in the city. Again, 15 years since our last reval, it's reasonable to expect that we would be outside of those standards. And the goals of the reval are to get us back into those standards. Um, mass appraisal. For a municipality, for valuing property for tax purposes, it's done on the principle of mass appraisal. Um, and mass appraisal is valuing a group of properties as of a given date using common data, standardized methods. We use models, we develop models based on uh, sales and cost data um, to essentially develop a model and then apply that model on large groups of properties. And that requires a lot of statistical testing to make sure that those models are fair, that they're accurate, that they bring equity to, uh, to, to differing properties. How many people have had a, a, an individual fee appraisal on their, on their property? Maybe you've gone for a mortgage, or maybe you've refinanced a mortgage, and somebody's had to come out to do an appraisal. Has anybody had that process done? So when you, if you've read that appraisal report, an appraiser came out, he looked at your property, he measured your property, he, he uh, jotted down the characteristics. He did a sales comparison. He looked at other similar properties in your neighborhood that recently sold, um, as well as looked at what the cost value of your property is. How much would it cost to build the reproduction of your property? And your appraisal report will very um, simply show all of those different approaches, and the appraiser's job is to reconcile those different values from the sales comparison and the cost approaches to come up with a market value for your property as of the date of that report. Now, if we all hired five different appraisers to come out to our properties to do, uh, to do appraisal reports, five different appraisers would have five different market values for your, for your property. Appraisers are going to use different sales. They're going to look at different costs. Um, the standards would say that if all of those appraisers were, were, were within 10% of the market value, that that's a successful project, um, that, that all of them followed standards to come within that 10%. But appraisal, by definition, very much is one's opinion of value. And that's why when you get an appraisal done, um, you may not have a value that you had on a previous appraisal, uh, appraisal uh, from, from an appraiser. In mass appraisal, again, we're doing this not individually. We're, we're developing models and applying those models over a large group of properties. So values of individual properties um, are not based on a sale price. Rather, models are consistently applied to large groups. That's the principle of mass appraisal. That's how any municipality for tax purposes um, conducts their revaluations and their, and their assessments. So revaluation brings with it a lot of fears. Um, you may have seen an op-ed that I um, had put in the Press Herald, and I literally opened up that op-ed with, it's the single word that strikes fear in most, pro the, the most fear in property owners, and that word is revaluation. Um, revaluation brings with it a lot of fears of, of residents and, and taxpayers, and the first one is, you're going to pay more taxes. And for some folks, that certainly is true. Increases in value that you may realize as a property uh, owner, however, do not necessarily relate to higher taxes. You may see your value increase. That doesn't necessarily mean your taxes are going to increase. And we're going to explain all that, how that is um, in, in some upcoming slides. Um, you may have heard that in a revaluation, 
um, the way that the tax burden falls because it's not, it's not only are we bringing values to 100% of market value, but we're redistributing that tax burden against all of those properties. And when you do that in a statistical um, exercise, you have a third, a third, and a third. A third of the properties are going to see their taxes go up, a third are going to see their taxes go down, a third are going to see their taxes stay relatively flat. Another fear is that, well, the government's going to spend more. Well, now we have all this new value in our tax base, which means that the, the, that the city is going to raise taxes. Um, they're, going to, they're going to spend more money for the, for the, for the city government and for the, school, uh, for the school department. And that not, is not necessarily um, true. In a revaluation, the, the government, the city, will not see a single additional dollar of tax revenue generated. Well, Chris, how can that be? We're raising the value pretty, uh, pretty drastically. How, how, how don't we raise any more taxes? Um, so our tax, your tax bill, your millage rate, is generated by taxable value of the overall city and what the budget says um, needs to be raised by property taxes to fund the budget. So currently, the city is in the fiscal year 20 budget. That's the budget that we're under right now. Um, in our FY20 budget, it called for raising $186 million in property taxes. That funds about 50% of the overall municipal budget for the, for the city. So about half of the budget is raised through property taxes. And again, for FY20, that amount was $186 million. That's what council voted on for the budget to, uh, to raise for the FY20 budget. Now, our total taxable assessed value in the city as a whole for FY20 was $7.9 billion. That's what, if you added everybody's individual assessments up, you'd come up with a total of $7.9 billion in change. So you take the $186 million that the budget calls for to be raised in property taxes, you divide that by the uh, overall value, the $7.9 billion, and you come up with a tax rate of $23.31. And everybody paid the same millage rate for FY20. Your assessment is times $23.31 per uh, every $1,000 of assessment, and that's what generates your tax bill. That $186 million doesn't change. Um, the city still needs that $186 million um, to fund the budget. But let's say in that same scenario that the taxable value is now $12 billion. The same $186 million still needs to be raised, but now the valuation is $12 billion. That would lower the millage rate down to approximately $15 and uh, 40 some cents, if I'm doing the math there correctly. Um, as values go up, the, the, uh, the, the millage rate goes down to, to uh, an equal, equal relation. So again, revaluation does not add additional, uh, an additional dollar um, to, uh, to, to the city budget or to the city coffers, but it does redistribute that tax burden. If you own a rental property, certainly a fear is you may have a loss of tenants. Any expenses increases that I'm going to see as a, as a landlord, I may need to pass that on to my tenants. And that may, uh, that may not be uh, uh, suitable for the tenants, and they may leave. Or may have to think about selling property. Of course, nobody wants to see those things happen, um, but these are all common fears when it comes to revaluation. But again, revaluation in, uh, in itself is a revenue neutral process. As the taxable assessment increases, the tax rate will decrease. Um, so in this example, um, we show here uh, a taxable increase of 40%. Now how does this affect you as an individual property owner? So let's say that after the revaluation, and again, I'm just hypothetically using a 40% number, but let's say that the overall value increase in the entire city is 40% after the revaluation. But for you on your individual property, your value also increased, but your value only increased by 38%, not 40%. Well, you would see a 2% tax decrease in that, in that scenario. Let's say that your individual value went up 42% and the overall value for the city was 40%. In that scenario, you would see a 2% tax increase. So it really is dependent upon what is your increase in value from the revaluation compared to the city's overall value. Um, but again, as the taxable rate goes up, uh, the taxable value goes up, the tax rate decreases, and it very much redistributes the tax burden. What does that mean? This is what tax equalization um, is in a nutshell um, that this slide demonstrates. So the last revaluation, 2004, 
Mrs. Smith and Mrs. Jones had very similar properties, and they were both assessed at $100,000. And that's currently their assessment today, $100,000. Based on our millage rate of $23.31 for every $1,000 of value, both Mrs. Smith and Mrs. Jones uh, would each pay $2,331, and the city would collect from both Mrs. Smith and Mrs. Jones $4,662. Now we're after uh, we've done a revaluation process and assessments have changed. Good news, Mrs. Smith and Mrs. Jones have both seen uh, an increase in their, in their value. Their, their investment has increased in value. But they've increased at different rates. Mrs. Smith is in a different part of town than what Mrs. Jones is in. She's in a neighborhood that, she has seen, that has seen values rise at a different rate than what Mrs. Jones' neighborhood has seen. Maybe Mrs. Smith has done some maintenance or some upgrades on her property that Mrs. Jones didn't. After the reval, Mrs. Smith's value is $300,000. Mrs. Jones, again, also sees an increase in value, but her increase goes to $150,000. When we redistribute that tax burden, the city still raises the same $4,662. That doesn't change. What does change is how that burden is applied um, to Mrs. Smith and Mrs. Jones. So up until the revaluation, Mrs. Jones essentially was paying 770 some dollars too much in taxes. Mrs. Smith was paying 700 uh, too less in taxes. The revaluation redistributes that tax burden so that everybody is paying their fair share. Nobody should pay more or less than their fair share of, of taxes. And when we get so far outside of a revaluation, um, this is exactly the scenario that happens. We have this scenario, this, this is the scenario that's going to play out in a lot of different neighborhoods in this revaluation process. A lot of our assessed values that are in place today are values that were assigned in the last revaluation in 2004. So there's certain phases of revaluation, different phases of a revaluation. We started this revaluation back in January. Um, with, our, with the data collection process and sketch verification process. Um, we have Tyler Technologies, um, who is our um, uh, consultant for doing our revaluation, and that leads me to forget that I totally forgot to introduce our representative from Tyler here. Real quick, I'd like to introduce Gint Gruby. Gint is our, Gint is our overall pro project manager for the revaluation from Tyler. Uh, Gint has been with Tyler for uh, over 30 years. He's done, he's uh, run revaluations re in multiple municipalities. And I do apologize for skipping right over that introduction when we started Gint. Um, but back in January, we sent some of our uh, assessment office um, uh, data to Tyler um, to really start um, some of that data collection process. Um, and we're going to go over some of the things that have been done up to this point. Data mailers, how many people, how many folks here received a data mailer from, from our office to, to verify characteristics of your property? We sent those out to almost 18,000 residences. We asked you to correct any data on them and send them back. Um, commercial property owners got what's called an income and expense statement so that we could see what their rents are, what their expenses are, um, and that's all part of the data collection process. We're through data collection and we are very much entrenched in our data analysis phase right now. Um, in data analysis, we are, we are looking at all of those data mailers. We, we got almost 11,000 of those data mailers returned to us, almost a 60% rate of return, which is phenomenal. We can't thank you guys enough for sending those back to us. But now we've got to go in and make those data changes. We have to review that, those, those data changes um, and, and analyze them to see what has changed. We're constantly looking at sales. The backbone of any revaluation process, the backbone of any valuation process in general is sales. And we're looking at sales back to 2017, back to April 1st of 2017. We're analyzing every sale in the city um, to, 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 to extract data out of that so that we can generate models to apply, uh, apply them for this revaluation. That process will take us right up to about April. And in April of 2020, that starts the notice and informal hearing process of the revaluation. So in April of 2020, you folks are going to get a new notice um, that's going to have your old value, what your old assessed value was, and what your new assessed value will be. What we won't necessarily know at that time is what the new millage rate is going to be. By that, time, by that, by that point in time, we won't know what the FY21 budget is going to call for from the council budget process. Um, and 
we know that the value will change because of the informal hearing process. Every homeowner has the full right and opportunity to come in and talk to us um, in the informal uh, uh, hearing process. There's going to be some changes made um, throughout that process, which is going to affect the overall valuation um, from the beginning of the, of the process. So by the end of July of 2020 into August, once we know what the new valuation is, once all the hearings are held and we know what the new valuation is, and based on what the budget is, then we can uh, determine what that millage rate is going to be. However, you'll still be able to estimate, um, uh, potentially be able to estimate what your tax change may be. Again, using the um, ratio that we showed on a previous slide, that if the overall city value goes up 40%, well, we can take the current millage rate and we can estimate that down by 40%, apply that to your new value, and that will give you a very rough estimate of, um, of, of what your new tax liability may be. Um, now, we'll put some instructions and we'll put some of this onto those notices so that you aren't left up to your own devices. Um, and we'll do our best to help um, bridge that gap, to give that data to you folks um, until an actual millage rate is formally set um, that you can then apply to your new value to determine exactly what your tax liability will be. But we will do our best to help you estimate um, to the best of our ability um, at that point in time. So, when we did data collection in this process, there's a lot of uh, processes, key processes that we used. Historically in a revaluation, and anybody, ha has anybody been through revaluation in the city of Portland before as a, as, a, as a resident? So the last one was done in 2004, the one before that was in the early 1990s. But historically revaluation is a lot of labor, a lot of boots on the ground that go to each and every single property. They knock on the door. They, they'll interview the property owner to ask them, can you tell me what you have inside? How many bedrooms? How many bathrooms? They'll actually take a tape measure and measure the outside of the structure to get measurements in a sketch. And while that person's there, they'll take a picture of the property. And then they move on right to the next property next door. With 24,000 parcels in the city like we have, that's a lot of people. And that takes a lot of time to, to do that. There's newer technology available um, that allows us to not use such a labor-intensive process, and that's what we brought to this revaluation project. And I'll explain um, how we did some of that. We took new street-level imagery. Um, we did new ortho and oblique imagery so that we can verify sketch, um, uh, sketch referencing. Um, we digitized some, uh, some older documents that the city's had in the, in the assessment process. So we'll start with street-level imagery. Right now, if you go to your property record card and take a look at it, you're going to see a picture of your property. We maintain a photo of every property in the city. But a lot of those fo uh, photos are older. They were uh, taken in 2004 in the last revaluation. Now, as appraisers in the assessment office, when we go out to visit properties because a new permit was taken out or a new addition, we will update a photo um, and we'll add that photo um, to the property record card. But we have a lot of photos that are still based from the last revaluation in 2004. We simply haven't visited all 24,000 of those properties in the last 15 years. Um, so we did new street level imagery. But instead of having a, a person on the ground with a camera go and take it, we essentially used a van with a camera mounted in the back. I shouldn't say we, Tyler. This is a, a product that Tyler um, provided. You may have seen this van back in the summer driving around blocks taking pictures. And this is what they were doing this project for, was so that we have all new updated street level imagery um, for this revaluation process. Um, in addition, we did new ortho, new aerial imagery of the city. This should be a pretty familiar uh, look at a map. Anybody that goes to Google Maps, Apple Maps, Bing Maps, this is what you're looking at. You're looking at an aerial, uh, an aerial overview. Um, but an ortho, ortho means top down, bird's eye view. But when you look at an ortho image, um, what, what is this building? How tall is this building? Um, what are the dimensions of this building? One of the things that we did when we had new imagery taken was called oblique photos. And that's photo that's done at an angle. And when you use oblique imagery, you get a photo like this on a 30 degree angle. Now you can very easily tell that this is the central fire station on Congress Street. You can see that this is a two story building. The aerial imagery that we had taken for this, pro for this project um, is uh, survey grade, meaning that we can use digital measuring tools right within this program to measure any building. And the measurements are accurate to within six inches. 
because they're survey grade um, uh, accuracy. This eliminates the need for uh, a, a small force of labor to go out and have to manually measure each and every property. Um, we, we can do this all through digital technology um, uh, pretty, pretty quickly, much more rapidly than what it would take, uh, again, boots on the ground to go out and measure all of these uh, properties. Not only does an oblique image show you just one side of a building, it shows you all four sides of a building. Uh, yes? Uh, just a question. Are you saying you took brand new photos or you sourced new photos from existing? No, we had, we had brand new imagery taken for the, for the entire city. The, nope. This was all done in May of 2018 that we had uh, this, this aerial imagery uh, photographed. Um, for part, not just for purposes of this revaluation, but as you can imagine, this type of imagery is very useful to many city departments. Public works, um, fire and, and, and police uh, love, this, love this imagery. It's very useful for a lot of different um, uh, departments. Planning, you can, do three, you can use this to do 3D modeling when a new project comes to, uh, to fruition. Um, but it is new imagery that was taken for purposes of this revaluation. And again, what it does is save um, uh, the labor and the manpower needed to go and do all this stuff um, on, on site for each, for each property. Oblique imagery, again, you can, allows you to see all the different sides of a, of a, of a building. We can see exactly what's on the exterior um, all the way uh, around, around the building. So another process that we brought with our data collection was sketch verification. In every revaluation that's been done, as I said, uh, appraisers or data collectors have been out to a property and they measure the property. They take a uh, tape measure and go around the property and measure. And they develop a sketch. They draw a sketch on a property record card. And we have sketches of properties back to the 1950s in our office. We have property record cards back to the 1950s revaluation in our, in our office. And they're full of sketches. All of these sketches over the years have been incorporated into our computerized um, assessment system that we use in the city in the assessor's office. And what Tyler did was they were able to take these sketches, they extracted them out of our database, they scaled them and overlaid them over top of that aerial imagery that we took. And essentially using a computer algorithm flagged all the properties where the sketch outline maybe doesn't match the building underneath. If a sketch, if a, if a part of a building came out past the sketch line, the sketch boundary, or if the sketch boundary didn't capture the entire building, it was able to flag for any anomalies. Um, and, and without having to send somebody to measure, we knew exactly the sketches across 24,000 properties um, that we needed to go out and remeasure and re-verify. So Tyler analyzed about 18,000 structures in the city using this technology. And 13% of them, roughly 2,200, um, had an anomaly that we needed to go out and field visit to field measure to correct something with the sketch. And that work um, happened over the summer. We had some appraisers that visited all 2,200 of those properties. Some of them may have come to your house. You may have gotten a yellow card in the door that said, hey, I knocked on the door. Nobody was here. I measured your property today, or I was here for, for the purpose of the reval. Um, and fixed all of the sketches um, that, this, uh, that this analysis uh, detected. Finally, we scanned um, a lot of old documents. In our office, we maintain property record cards back to the 1950s, and they get used a lot. People come in and do research all the time, and these are, these are cards that are filled out in pencil that have been in and out of file cabinets um, since they were created, since the 50s. We maintain the 50s, the 80s, and the 90s property record cards in our office. Um, to preserve these cards, what we did was we digitally scan them so that they're available electronically. Um, and we will make these electronically to the public. We get a lot of folks that come in that want to pull old property record cards to see what was there, what existed in 1950 on this property. Now we'll make this available that you can come to the property uh, assessor's website to, to do a property search and you'll see these cards for properties. Over 70,000 of these property record cards were scanned as, as part of this process. So now that we have all of this information from data collection, we can start to verify um, and we, have a, we kind of have a complete record now of, of, of that property. We can review multiple data sets. We can verify all the property characteristics. We have a street level image. We have a sketch. We have the oblique imagery that we can see all sides. We, we have the data mailers that you sent back. They are also uh, scanned and available digitally. And now we can start to look and, s and see what data do we need to change on this, on, on this property. 
we can essentially confirm all building attributes and outbuildings. That was our data collection process that started in January and pretty much just finished up in, in October. So again, we're doing all of this. All of this data helps us to come up with very reliable, very accurate models um, in, the, in, the, um, in the process of determining what is a market value of a property. Um, but before we can do that, we probably should define what is market value? What are we solving for exactly? What, what does market value mean? And right out of the dictionary, the uh, textbook definition of market value is defined as the most probable price that a property should bring in a competitive and open market under all conditions requisite to a fair sale, the buyer and seller each acting prudently and knowledgeably, assuming the price is not affected by undue stimulus. Notice that it says the most probable price that a property would bring. Not the highest price that a property would bring, but the most probable price. How do you determine the most probable price? You're looking at a lot of different sales of similar properties, essentially to come up with a range to determine what is a good market value for any particular neighborhood or group of, a group of homes in a, in a neighborhood. And when we look at sales, um, again, we're going back to April 1st of 2017 and looking at every sale that occurred in the city. Over 5,500 sales of property have happened um, in, in the city since April 1st of 2017. But not all of those sales are good sales to use for statistical purposes of a revaluation. We really want sales that are what's known as an arm's length transaction. And what does that mean? These five criteria have to be met in order to use a sale in a sales ratio study. Um, again, buyer and seller are typically motivated. Everybody is well informed and well advised, acting in their own best interest. A property has been exposed on the open market. Um, payment for that property is made in terms of cash or comparable financial arrangement, which means uh, essentially means a mortgage. What that means is we are eliminating our, uh, anything that's not an arm's length transaction. If it is a short sale, if it is a sale between interfamily or intercorporations, if it's an estate sale, a foreclosure sale, um, a sale that the sale price for, there's no reason it, it sold for triple what it should have sold for, or it sold for uh, three times less the amount it should have sold for, it's an outlier. We will not include those sales as part of the sales ratio. Um, we want uh, true arm's length transactions. That is how, that is the best way to define um, a range of market value in any ratio study. Um, so, again, out of 5,500 sales that we analyzed, um, we're, less than half of them are being used um, for our sales ratio study. And we do this um, to look at, again, market value. How do we come to market value? There are three general approaches to market value that any appraiser uh, uses. Anybody that's seen an appraisal report for a property, you'll see these three approaches discussed in your appraisal report. An appraiser has to look at all three of these approaches. They have to derive a value using all three of these approaches, and then their job is to reconcile these values to come up with one market value for a property. So these approaches are the cost approach. Cost approach is market value derived by determining the cost required to construct a replacement of a property and then deducting out for depreciation. Then you have your sales approach or your market approach. And that is very simply comparing recently sold properties of a similar type, similar style, similar characteristics. You make value adjustments for any differences. If two properties are essentially the same, one has uh, two full bathrooms, this one only has a bathroom and a half, you would make an adjustment in sales comparison approach for that, for that half bathroom. The final approach is called the income approach. Um, this is really used in commercial um, uh, valuation or residential properties where uh, rent is being um, uh, uh, taken. Um, for most residential properties, the income approach is the least used approach, um, unless, again, the house or the home is being rented out. Um, but essentially, in an income approach, market value is derived um, by valuing the present worth of the future benefits of ownership for having that income producing property. Um, earlier this month, we had a, a, one of these forums for commercial property owners um, right here in this room, and the income approach was the only approach that was discussed in that, uh, in that forum. Um, we're not going to spend uh, any time today in the residential uh, forum talking about the income approach. We are going to focus mostly on the cost and the sales market approach. Those are the two most widely used for residential uh, properties and two that we're relying on certainly in the, in the revaluation.
So what is cost approach? Cost approach is a very simple formula. Replacement cost new, less depreciation, adding in a land value gets you a market value. So how do we come up with these numbers when we do a cost approach? When we look at replacement cost new, there are a number of national cost valuation guides that are available. We use uh, the most uh, widely known one, uh, the most common one, which is called Marshall and Swift Cost Manual. Marshall and Swift develops their cost manuals for appraisers to do a cost analysis, a cost approach like this. Insurance companies use Marshall and Swift to determine insurable rates. Depreciation rates, um, Marshall and Swift will, tell, will come up with depreciation rates. Um, took uh, this Marshall and Swift cost manual, it's like a thousand pages, and it goes over every facet of construction, down to shingles and sidings um, and different types of uh, siding and uh, plywood that can be used in, in construction. But at its base, I just pulled some data right out of the Marshall and Swift manual for this, for this slide. If we look at a single family uh, dwelling that's rated of good quality, it, uh, Marshall and Swift assigns a base rate of $135 for that single family property. Um, the last update of Marshall and Swift was in August of 2018. That's what that date means. And then we look at um, coming up with what that value is today. And we do that by two different multipliers. The first is what Marshall and Swift calls a current multiplier. And that essentially takes um, uh, the period of time of today um, versus when this data was obtained in August of 2018. So essentially the current multiplier says since August of 2018 to today, that base rate has gone up by 2%, 1.02 to 2%. It's been a 2% increase in the cost of construction since August of 2018 in a single family. The other thing that Marshall and Swift does is it looks at local markets. And if you go to Marshall and Swift, you will literally find a page for Portland, Maine, um, for every state, markets in every state. And they have local multipliers um, uh, based on data that they get from builders and construction companies um, to formulate this data. And for a single family, good quality home in Portland, um, there's a multiplier of 0.99. So essentially, you take the 135, um, apply the multipliers, and we come up with a composite final, uh, final rate of 136. 32, and you can see I put some other um, right out of the Marshall and Swift guideline. But this is essentially just valuing the shell of the property. We're not taking into account anything inside the property, no outbuildings or garages. This is essentially to value what a shell of a single family property would be. Um, this is the basis of coming of determining what the replacement cost new of a, of a property is. Then we have to factor in depreciation. Depreciation is measured by three criteria. Physical depreciation, functional uh, depreciation, external depreciation. Physical, de uh, physical depreciation um, really is deterioration, loss in value due to normal wear and tear of, of a property. The first uh, depreciation uh, measurement is age. How old is your property? Obviously, a house built in 1900 has a vastly different depreciation value than a house constructed in, in the 2000s. Um, Normal wear and tear, deferred maintenance, those things would affect physical depreciation of a property. Functional obsolescence is a loss in value due to the inability of the structure to perform adequately. The best example, or the example I like to use for this, you have a single family home that's for sale, it's five bedrooms, five big bedrooms, but there's only one full bed. Um, in today's day and age, that's not a desirable property for most people. If you're looking at a home that requires five bedrooms, you're, you're thinking that your, your needs are going to be for more than just one full, full bath. So the fact that you've got a property may have five bedrooms with one full bath is going to affect its market value. It's not going to sell for the same that a, that a home with two and a half baths would sell for if it had five bedrooms. So there's a depreciation factor that goes into that um, to measure what is the loss in value for having that, that functional obsolescence. Another example I'll use is in older homes, sometimes um, you may have two bedrooms that are connected with each other that requires you to walk through one bedroom to get to the other bedroom. You don't have necessarily a hallway with a door to access that, that other bedroom. Well, that, that, there's functional obsolescence in that because when somebody's looking for a house today, they're looking, they're not, that's not what they're looking for. So that, there's an impact to market value on that. And that's measured by depreciation. Um, economic obsolescence and external obsolescence, if um, you have a property and 
All of a sudden, next door to you, a new fast food restaurant is, is built. And then on the other side of you, a convenience store is built. That's absolutely going to impact the value of your property that's sitting in between these. That's uh, an external obsolescence. There's external depreciation. The value, your value, your market value is affected by those two things occurring, and we need to be able to measure that by, by some level of depreciation um, as it relates to your market, market value of that. So we have replacement cost new, we subtract out any depreciation, now we have to add in the land value. Um, in Portland, um, the, uh, the methods used um, for land value is what's called the baseline method. And essentially what that means is in any neighborhood, there's a baseline um, uh, rate. The example I'm using here is there's an 8,000 square foot base lot. The rate on that is $10 per square foot. So that 8,000 square foot base lot now is for $80,000 right off the bat. You then have an adjustment rate to that. Um, and what that means is incremental or decremental. You increase that base rate um, for anything over 8,000 square feet, and you decrease that uh, uh, adjustment rate for anything less than 10, uh, for uh, 8,000 square feet. So in the example that I have here for a 10,000 square foot lot, we start with our 8,000 square foot base lot value of $80,000. We use the incremental value, 2,000 additional square feet at $5 a square foot, adds an additional $10,000. So that 10,000 square foot lot values at $90,000. On the flip side of that, looking at 6,000 square foot lot, now we're uh, subtracting out the, uh, the 2,000 square feet from the base lot, and we come up to a value of $70,000. Base lots in every neighborhood is different, again, based on sales, based on sales analysis, modeling of specific neighborhoods. But this is a method that's used to value lots of land in the uh, University of Yes? Uh, what happens if your land has, it goes down into a gully and it has the Ottawa trails? Um, so our uh, CAMIS, our, and I keep calling it our CAMIS system. CAMIS stands for Computer Assisted Mass Appraisal. That is a software appraisal system that we use to value the property. Um, and there are uh, descriptors for land uh, that mention topography. Is it flat? Is it below the street? Is it above the street? Is it hilly? Um, is it rolling? Um, so uh, there's there a slope uh, that a property has into it. We would identify that there's a slope and there would be an appropriate adjustment made to reflect um, that maybe you're not, you don't have a level, that maybe you don't have a level to a lot. Um, those are characteristics that are, that are determined, again, in all of the data analysis that we're doing with the, with the, with the mapping, and just data from uh, prior evaluations that data was, was, was captured. So our cost, uh, in our cost analysis, our cost approach to value, 2,000 square foot house, we use our replacement cost new for Marshall and Swift, it's $180 a square foot. 2,000 square feet will value $360,000. We factor in depreciation that comes to a level of 25%. So we subtract out $90,000, that gives us a building value of $270,000. Remember, when you look at your tax bill, when you look at your assessment, it's made up of two parts, the building value and your land value, and that's your total assessed value. So we have our building value, replacement cost new, less depreciation, now we add in the value of our land, and that gives us the market value. That is a very clean, very simple cost approach to uh, value. Next, we'll go to the sales comparison, the market. And this is when we start to look at these 5,500 sales of property um, throughout the city. Um, this map um, that's on the screen here, this is assessment neighborhoods. The, the models that we do get applied to different um, assessment neighborhoods. Now, assessment neighborhoods are different than the geopolitical neighborhoods that we may be familiar with. Voting districts, we all live in a voting district, district one through five. Or a neighborhood boundary, Riverton, uh, Back Cove neighborhood, Deering, uh, Deering Center, East Deering. Assessment boundaries include, assessment neighborhoods include some of those geopolitical, but the boundaries are very much based on styles of similar type properties. And in every revaluation, assessment neighborhood maps change based on, based on sales. This is the map that was put in place in 2004 um, based, on, based on sales analysis that was done. Um, and we will be making some changes to these, uh, to these different neighborhoods and then, uh, based on the sales data that we're extracting in this um, sales out of this area of, uh, this is residential properties in the city, our sales ratio study back to April 1st of 2017 um, came up with 1,400 verified valid sales. 
Now we start to look at those sales to say, well, what is that ratio? What is the ratio of assessment to market value? And how equitable are these sales? And when we did that data uh, for this for this review now, we came up with, again, 1,402 sales back to April 1st, 2017. And those sales reflect that we have a ratio of 70%. So current assessments of those properties, of those properties that are sold, um, are only uh, indicating 70% of their market value. More importantly, we can see that the quality rating, which again is that coefficient of dispersion, um, is 18. We're almost at that standard of 20 that, that the state um, uh, makes us, uh, wants us to be under. And that shows us that out of those 1,400 sales, they're not, we're not very equitable between our, between our assessed values between those sales. We look at our islands. And our islands, we had 84 um, verified sales. And that gave us an average ratio, when we looked at those sales, we had an average ratio of 84%. A little unusual for our islands. Anybody that's been around for the last couple of revaluations knows that the islands experienced some of the largest increases in property values. So much so that we had an island back in the 90s that seceded from the city of Portland because they were so aggrieved by the change in their value. Um, what this shows us is that over the last 15 years, um, the, va uh, the value of island properties um, have maintained rather well. We're at 84% of value. Um, we, there is some inequity in, uh, in, in those sales, um, but they, they held their value. And the islands actually are the highest ratio of any neighborhood, uh, of any sector of, of the city. That's definitely unusual for island residents. Um, and expect island residents to see increases in values that may, may not necessarily, however, relate to an increase in value. We looked at condos as a whole um, back to April 1st of 2017. We have a lot of condos in the city, as I'm sure you're aware. Eight out of 876 condo sales, we have an average ratio of 68%, meaning that their assessments are not reflective of their true market value. Remember, the state standard is 70%. In our, in our condo segment, we're below that state standard. Um, quality rating is 14. So again, what we're seeing, the common theme in this, we have a lot of inequity in our assessments. Um, as is to be expected when it's been 15 years from, uh, from a revaluation. This chart is a scatter plot of, of, of um, all of the verified sales that we looked at back to April 1st of 2017. Um, and we see a trend line that is sloping down. It's a negative trend line. Um, and essentially, this shows us exactly the inequity that we have in our system. Not only are we inequitable between similar type problems, we have inequity amongst different value of properties, different price of properties. We have what's called, uh, we have what's called a regressive assessment uh, right now in the city of Portland, and this shows that higher priced properties are assessed at lower values than what lower priced properties are assessed for. Okay, and I'll say that again. This is regressive. Higher priced properties are, are currently assessed at lower rates than lower priced properties. That should not be. Everybody should be assessed equally. That's the goal of a revaluation, um, is to bring equity to, uh, to, to, to our assessments. Mm -hmm. So when we look at our sales ratio testing that, we, that, that we've done uh, up to this point, we have our assessment ratio. Again, assessment to sale uh, to, to market uh, ratio. Um, currently, uh, our value for the city of Portland is at 70. The state says that we're required to have a minimum of, of uh, or the minimum standard is 70 percent. We don't want to fall below that minimum standard. The IAAO standard says we should be between 90 and 110 percent. Without doing the revaluation, we would fall below the state um, the state standards. We're already well outside the IAAO standard. Um, that's one of the reasons why we're doing the revaluation is to get back to 100 percent market value. Our coefficient of dispersion again how how inequitable are our, uh, our assessments. IAAO standard says we should have a coefficient of dispersion of 15 or less. State law, the state of Maine, the guideline, the standard for municipalities is no more than a maximum of 20, no higher than 20. Currently in the city of Portland, we're at 18. We have a lot of energy in our assessed values. These last two, um, price-related differential and price-related bias, go back to show us the relationship between lower price and higher price properties. Now, there's no state standard for a price-related differential or a price-related bias, but the IAAO does have standards. 
And we are outside of the standards because we're, what we're seeing is higher, we're, our assessments are biased towards higher price properties because they are not assessed to the same level as our lower price properties. And right here is the statistical measure to show us that. And, is, and, and what, this, what these two columns are showing us right here is essentially this, this uh, scatter. So what are the goals for, for this revaluation? Particularly the City of Portland 2019 revaluation. What are our goals? Well, we want to implement new values for all properties to reflect 100% of market value. We want to get everybody up to 100% of the market value as of April 1st of 2020. And we want to secure a more equitable distribution of the tax burden. Everybody should be assessed equally. Properties should be assessed to the same standards, to the same levels. Internally, in the assessment office, we're also taking uh, this, this revaluation to update and modernize some of our systems and our procedures. So I showed you some of the aerial uh, imagery that we did and how we are able to measure um, properties now. We don't have to physically go visit every single property every time we need to measure. We can pull up those aerials and we can do pretty accurate measurements of properties from those aerial images. The last time that our assessment system that we used was updated was back in 2010. So with this revaluation, we'll get updates, um, fresh updates, the latest version of the assessment uh, software that we use. This, um, one of the things that uh, newer software allows for is more regression analysis, more looking at sales, more looking at uh, data, um, a lot quicker than what, uh, what you can do with, say, Excel. And what this will allow for, one of our biggest goals in this, is to allow for smaller value changes to be made on a more frequent basis. Um, no more of these large scale decade revaluation processes that drastically uh, increase or change values. We can, we can do this um, uh, much more efficiently um, as, as, we, as we go along by, by looking and extracting out all of the data that we have on, on market sales. Um, so we're updating our software systems to be able to do Again, um, the goal here is to come to 100% market value, but when we do that, we need to make sure that we have four things. We need to make sure that the models that we're creating, that the data that we're looking at, um, that when we apply this, that these models are reliable. These models are going to go into our assessment system, and they're going to stay there for, for quite a, a for, for some, some, some time. Models that we have now in our assessment system were developed in 2004, the last revaluation. So when we're making new models for a new revaluation, we need to make sure that those models are reliable. We need to meet uh, uh, statistical uh, testings and statistical standards. They need to be accurate. We need to get our data as accurate as possible. We do that with some of the technology that we're using in this revaluation. The aerial imagery, the street level photos that we're taking, the data mailers that we sent to you guys to help us correct some of the data on properties. The more accurate our data is, the more accurate our models, the more reliable our models. We want to make sure that our models and the values that we're placing are valid and equitable. Again, no one should pay more, for, uh, more or less than their fair share. Um, and in order to do that, we have to be equitable. And as we can see, we, we have a lot of inequity in our current um, uh, assessment system. So what does this all mean uh, for you? What does, this, what does this all mean to you? Well, it prepares you for your upcoming numbers, okay? Um, in April, you're going to get a new value. Um, that starts the informal hearing process. In the last revaluation, uh, roughly 3,000 uh, uh, informal hearings were held um, uh, with folks. Um, our plan for informal hearings uh, for this revaluation is not to make everybody come down to City Hall. We'll have hearing sites set up in different places in the, in the, in the city to make it a little bit more convenient for folks that may be off Peninsula, um, or folks that may be around the islands. Um, but again, everybody has the right to appeal um, their, their new value. Keep in mind that when you do appeal, you're appealing the value, the new value. Um, so we want you guys to bring in recent appraisals, uh, cost estimates, maybe if you have a recent addition um, or some type of construction, um, that's the type of data that you want to bring in with you um, when you're appealing your value. Um, if you come into an appeal and you tell the Tyler folks, my taxes are just too high. Chances are they're going to have a pretty neutral reaction to that. Um, what you're appealing is the, is the value of your property, not necessarily the, the, the taxes. Um, if you don't like the tax rate, that process is uh, essentially talk to your city councilor, um, be involved in the budget process. The, the budget process is what sets the tax rate. 
the assessment process is what sets the value that that millage rate is applied to. I hope today um, has helped you, or help, I hope this uh, presentation has helped you understand the revaluation process and the different methods that are used in the revaluation. Um, and also, again, helps you prepare um, for hearings that uh, take place. The last thing I want to talk about, this is another common question that we get right after, why are we doing a revaluation? Is what tax relief? Is there any tax relief programs available? And there are a number of different tax relief uh, programs available to the residents. Uh, the biggest one is uh, that everybody's probably most familiar with is the homestead exemption program. If you've owned your property for at least 12 months and your property is your primary residence, it's not a second home, it's not a vacation home, it's your primary residence, you qualify for the homestead exemption in Maine. In Portland, 8,740 properties are enrolled and approved for homestead. In, in our current um, budget year, fiscal year 20, every property receives $16,800 exemption, um, and that related to about $391 and change in direct tax relief realized in your tax bill. Now, on April 1st of 2020, that value is going to go up. The state legislature increased that exemption to $25,000 of exemption. If you're not in Homestead, you definitely want to make sure that you get enrolled in Homestead. Um, I'll show you a website where you can go and check that. You can also call the assessment office and also verify for you whether or not you're in Homestead. You can also look at your tax bill. And if you see a number, uh, $16,800 in the exemption column in your tax bill, you are enrolled in receiving the homestead. It's a one-time application. Once you enroll and are approved, you, will, you stay in the homestead. You don't have to apply every year until the property is no longer your primary residence. Um, the other thing happening with homestead, the legislature in the last session um, approved tax relief in the form of rebate or refund checks. Every property owner in the state of Maine who is currently enrolled in Homestead in January is going, to, is going to receive a check of a little over $100 from the state in tax relief. Um, we hope that that's a program that continues um, throughout. Hopefully the value of that will increase. Um, but um, you know, any, any relief uh, is, is good relief. Um, but if you're not enrolled in Homestead, you will not see the benefit of getting that check from the state. So that's another important reason to make sure that you're enrolled in Homestead. The state also offers a veteran's exemption, a qualifying veteran 62 years of older, or a veteran that is receiving 100% disability from the VA um, will qualify for a veteran's exemption. Um, in certain cases, a surviving spouse of a veteran, a minor child of a veteran, a widowed parent of a veteran may also qualify for the state's veteran exemption. The state has a blind exemption for any homeowner who's legally blind, and locally, uh, Portland has a uh, tax relief program for seniors, specifically for seniors, called the Peace Step Program or the Portland Senior Tax Equity Program. It's available to qualified homeowners and renters. You must be 62 years or older to qualify. You have to receive the main property tax fairness credit. That's a credit that when you do your state income tax, when you file your annual 1040 ME form with the state of Maine, if you qualify and you, if you receive a refund or a credit, under that program at the state, the city will match that dollar for dollar. So if you get, if you receive a credit of $500 under the, under the state property tax fairness credit, your application process will require you to show that you receive that credit, and then the city will essentially match that dollar for dollar, and they will issue you a check for that same amount that you received from the, from the state. The application period for that every year is March 15th through May 15th. Applications are available online. They are available in the city assessor's office. They're available in the city treasury office. Applications are available for this every January. This is, a, this is an application that you do need to fill out every year. It very much is dependent upon verifying um, so, uh, that you are qualified. Um, but if you get the property tax fairness credit, if you know you get that from the state and you're over 62, um, you definitely want to apply for this because again, the city's going to match uh, what you receive from the state is dollar for dollar. That is all that I have for you this evening. A couple of important websites, revalueportland.me. That is the website that we have for, specifically for the revaluation. Uh, notices of meetings like this are, are on there. Um, there's, a, there's a bunch of different uh, information on there. We've sent brochures of properties back in April. We've sent data mailers out. 
Uh, examples of all those are located online. We have a number of videos um, to explain the revaluation process. Again, those videos were professionally done. and do a heck of a lot better job than what I, uh, what I can do um, uh, up here. PortlandAssessors.com, that's the website to look, at your, to look at your property. You can go on the PortlandAssessors.com, you can put in your address or your parcel ID number, and you can see what your current assessment is. You can see if you're receiving a homestead exemption. You can see all the characteristics that we have on the property. Um, finally, uh, the, the Portland uh, website, portlandmain.gov, lots of information there. Um, you can see your property tax bill there. You can go to any of the city departments there. This phone number, 874-8763, that's a phone number that we have established specifically for the revaluation. It's a revaluation helpline. Um, that phone is staffed by, uh, by somebody during the day. Um, any questions that you have, um, any discussions that you want to have, that's the phone number uh, to call. Um, again, when notices do go out of new values that will start the informal process, um, we'll have instructions there on what you will need to do to schedule an appeal here. And uh, remember, if, you're, if you think your value is too low, we want to hear that too. So please come on into the hearing. That is what we, we do want to hear that as well. Um, with that, that is all I have for you this evening. Again, I appreciate you and thank you for taking the time to come out um, on a Monday night. I know there's various other city meetings happening tonight. I appreciate you took the time to come to this one. And with that, I would love to uh, start uh, and help answer any questions that anybody may have. Yes? Um, I have a question when you were going into the, the I just trying to see how your process is very dangerous. But I was curious about, when you were talking about the, the sale evaluation. Yes. Okay. So, there, let's say, so let's just have them they say there are houses in your neighborhood that have, a lot of them have been sold lately, much more than what they're comfortable with your house, but they're getting a lot more realistic ones. Yes, yeah, so and your assessment doesn't reflect that. that, that so, what I'm kind of curious is, you know, you see pictures, you see databases, you see forms. Mm -hmm. But from a real estate point of view, the houses that were selling for a lot more money, they had a newer bathroom. Absolutely. They were floors. They had Absolutely. a new heating system put in. Yep. Absolutely. So how do you factor in those so, right, so there's, several, there's several different ways we do that. Number one, we have access to all the permits that the city issues. Oh. And the bread and butter of kind of what the assessor's office does from year to year in between revaluations is uh, taking all those permits and we go out and visit all of those projects in any given year to determine why was this permit taken out? Um, is the improvement that's being made on this permit, does it, does it, does it affect the, the value of the assessed value? But you don't need, let's say, a meeting system. You don't need a permit to get a new boiler, to get a new hot oil. How would you know that? There, there, there are some things where we wouldn't do that. Um, so other ways that we determine that, we simply ask the property owner. We ask uh, the, the part of that data mailer. Um, we may look at a listing online to see what was replaced. Uh, you have certainly lots of different red websites, realtor.com, redfin.com, uh, the MLS uh, uh, listings. We talk to brokers. We talk to real estate agents. Talk to buyer and sellers. On the data mailers that went out, there was a, a, a on the back page of the data mailer, there was a section that says, if you uh, you recently purchased this property, if you purchased it after January 1st of 17, tell us a little bit about the sale. Was this a month's length transaction? Have you made any improvements? Have you updated anything? Okay. Was anything updated before you purchased it? So we, we look at all of that data and we do our best to make an educated decision based on the data that's available to us. Admittedly, there are sometimes there's data that we just don't have and we don't know. So, let's say you have one, you know, you have Main Street, you have the information on one Main Street. Yep. But five Main Street, they didn't sell their house. It was in a sale before. So, so, so remember in that sales ratio study that I showed, you know, we have 1,400 verified sales that we're that we're using. Well, that's great for those 1,400 properties, but there's 22,000 other properties that didn't that, that didn't sell. Um, and that is essentially uh, exactly what a sales ratio study is intended to do, looking at recent sales to extract data to create a model that then you place that model over the other groups of properties that, that, haven't, that haven't sold. That, that's mass appraisal in a nutshell, because we can't go do an individual appraisal report for each and every single property. We have to do it by the mass appraisal approach. Okay. I hope that explains your... Uh, well, I'm just concerned that if you, 
got a bunch of houses who have made significant improvements, mm -hmm. and then you have some who haven't. Are the people who haven't made those improvements going to get an increase because you're basing it on the... So they're certainly going to get an increase because their value has increased, but they should not get an increase to the same level that the ones with the, the, the uh, additions or renovations have done, simply because they would have more depreciation in something that isn't updated versus the ones that are. Now again, you're, you're very much right. That's contingent on us knowing that the other properties have had um, improvements done to them. And we feel that we, we do a pretty good job every year um, of, of looking at our permits and knowing what happens um, uh, in, that, in that process. Um, yes, some things do slip through the cracks and when we find it, we, we certainly make adjustments as, as needed. Um, but permit data is a big part of what we do day in, day out basis in the assessor's office. Yes, sir? Uh, just uh, add, add also, ma'am, mm -hmm. uh, that when you receive your notice, if you think uh, your uh, property is assessed too high in relation to other properties on your street, mm -hmm. give us a call. Come on in. We'll talk about it. And uh, we'll, 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 uh, we'll take uh, uh, what, what you have to say into consideration. Okay. Uh, absolutely. If we have data wrong, we, we, we want to hear from you. We want to make sure that our data is correct so that you have a fair and equitable uh, uh, value. Yeah. The informal hearings, they very are sit down face-to-face -face meetings to talk about um, how is your property derived? What data characteristics, what data points do we have for your, for your property? And that's why I say, if you have a recent appraisal or you have um, uh, construction costs or anything, bring all that stuff with the appeal here. We want to we see what you have. We want to review it today. If, if we need to make changes, we certainly will. Mm -hmm. Yes? Um, as you know, we've had a lot of demolition, especially on Montjoy Hill. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of these massive, enormous, blocks of condos that have gone up for sale um, at very, very high prices. Many, many of those are being sold as second homes and seasonal residences. And yet, those of us that live up there full time and have for a number of years, how, how are we being affected by these people who aren't even? So a lot, a lot of those sales, um, and uh, I'll say, Gant's been doing this for 30 years, he has essentially uh, ripped his hair out over looking at sales studies on Montjoy Hill. So there are so many sales up there that simply don't make sense. There are so many outlier sales up there. The, the, the fact that people are paying $500,000 for a 3,000 square foot lot is insanity. And then, and then on top of that, then they're building an $800,000 uh, you know, uh, structure on, on top of that. In a sales ratio study, you're always, you're, you're always eliminating your outliers taking uh, kind of the, the, the central meat of a sales ratio study. You're getting rid of your lows, you're getting rid of your extreme highs. And in that process, a lot of those real crazy sales um, are, are kind of invalidated. Um, they're, they're, not, they're not used for valid sales. But there are certainly a number of sales on Montjoy Hill um, where we can show that they are arm's length transactions. It's not just somebody purchasing it because they want to tear down this old home constructed in 1950 and build something new. Um, however, those sales do go into to a sales ratio model, and the value of Montjoy Hill is vastly different today than it was back in 2004, and it is based on arm's length transactions of sales, and when we see sales up there of a 1,200 square foot ranch for $450,000 um, when, there's, when, there's, when there's a bunch of those sales, that, that is essentially becomes, becomes the market. Now again, so we're going to end up having to pay the price for all of that, aren't we? You're you're certainly going to see. Uh, I am not going to show it in any way. That we you're, better just you're, sit you're, down. You're, 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 <laughs> that's that's <laughs> all that's going on in my life. That is a lot. There's nothing. I've lived there for 16 years. And that's all that's going on in my, I, I did a little work on my house. I've had neighbors that done like tiny bits of work on them. Everything else is a condo or some, if you don't park in your driveway, somebody will build a house in it. It's ridiculous. So basically, we're all going to take the brunt of that, even though we've lived there for all this time. Uh, and, and again, I'll say that. Should we all sell our houses and turn them into condos? Oh, we can tear them down. It really makes some money. I don't exactly. know where we're going to live, but you know that's not uh, You know, an increase in value does not necessarily relate to, the, to an increase in taxes, um, but, but a, a lot of folks are going to see an increase in their, in their value. And, and there's no, there, there is no, there, there is no uh, uh, doubt about it that and values are not just Montreal Hill, the, the peninsula as a whole. Um, the, the ratio, the, the 
assessment to market value ratio is, is a lot lower on the peninsula than it is in the rest of the city. But we also have the issue with the, the Montreal Hill, I know there's been at least over 40 affordable housing units that have been driven off the hill because of this building. So there's very little, much less and less and less rent up there. How is this going to affect? I happen to own my own, my home, my condo. I also own another condo in the same building because my condo, we, we couldn't stand anyone who lived up here. So we just <laughs> bought it. <laughs> but I want to, it's like, I'm trying to keep that as something reasonable, but I'm going to tell you if, if what happens to me, what you're saying is going to happen, how am I supposed to keep that reasonable? So even if I have a place that I try to keep reasonable, I won't be able to do it because of the, the property tax. I completely understand. The data of the market is very much driven by what is happening. But isn't it a bubble? Though? I mean, is this not a bubble? It's, you think this is going to continue? Oh, I think any, I think any market, any city is is, is a bubble. I mean, we, we've all seen. I mean, listen, there's ebbs and flows in any market. Um, uh, I've been saying this for for the past two years. Like, what is going to happen sure. when Wex? Yeah, Wex is done, and everything else at the base of the hill of Munjoy Hill is done. And it's February, and you can't clear the snow. Eventually, people are not going to want to live in these condos, yep. and you're going to reassess our taxes that we're going to be stuck. Well, but, but eventually, that data is going to bear itself out in market data, right? If values start to come down, or people aren't paying the prices they're going to pay, we're going to see that in market data, and assessment adjustments are going to be made. Again, um, I mean, ten years. Yeah. One of the goals of this revaluation is not to do these long-term, decade-long revaluation processes. We, we can get, with newer technology, we can react a lot faster to market data that we're seeing. And the goal of this reval, with, with new software that we're, that we're getting, is to do smaller value changes in more frequent increments. Whether that, value change, whether that smaller value change is up or down, we want to be able to do them smaller and more frequent intervals. And waiting 10 or 15 years to do a large scale evaluation process. Um, the, the market may, we may see a market crash in the next couple of years. Um, we're not, not going to wait till a revaluation to go through and, 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 and adjust uh, assessments across the city. We're going to be able to react to that as, as market data shows that that is happening. Yes, yes, sir. Can you give an example of, <coughs> excuse me, of your one third, one third, one third? Can you give an example of one of the one thirds that goes down? <laughs> Well, sure, something that, no. well, so in the example that I used with this. Was the million basis. dollar end over here, that's the way I kind of read it, was the million dollar condo. So on your dot, yeah. on your dot diagram, uh -huh. it showed uh, $25 million, and they're coming from his neighborhood, I guess. I'm not from that neighborhood. But where is, you know, one third, one third, one third. We obviously know where the one third Where's the two, the one in the middle and the one going down? So, so that what that scatter, what, what that diagram showed was that our higher priced properties are assessed at a lower rate than lower uh, properties. So in the scenario that you're saying, they would be some of the one third that would, that would, that would go up. That would we want to bring them back to an equal level. Um, they, they, should, they, should, they should be affected more, more, more drastically being on that, being on that end of, of So the, on the uh, other end, where all the dots were on the lower end, that would be the one third going Correct. down. If, if, if you, um, if I can go back to, I apologize, yeah, if you just went back through it. all this. Well, I'm going to go back to the, to the, to the tax burden side um, because I think this illustrates the, I think this illustrates the best um, in that scenario. In this scenario, Mrs. Smith was in the one third that went up. Mrs. Jones was in the one third that, that, that went down. But at that same point, I just did the math here a little while ago. Uh, Mrs. Smith got a 33.3% 30, increase. Her taxes, transfer to one up. $777. Yeah, that is one third. One third. That's a huge amount. If you nailed some of us we're, we're, in well, Portland, we're, we're only using 30. two properties for the basis of this. We're not using the other side. So I, I understand, I'm just what, I understand to say, what you're saying. Smith, they Taxes just went up by a third. Right. That's a lot. It, that is a lot. Okay. That is a lot. Mrs. Jones is quite happy with it. Just went down. Yes. There's a, a factor here that has not been discussed at all in any of the discussions I've heard is the overall valuation of the city. 
in other words, the tax base with all the construction of all these um, 700 to million dollar condo units, mm -hmm. the tax base has to have gone up. Oh, no, it has. And so the tax are, base, um, and I don't have the slide with me, um, our tax base um, goes up roughly anywhere between one to two percent a year, um, historically over the last six or seven years. Um, our, 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 set, our taxable assessed value does increase every year. Um, it doesn't increase at the rate that the market is increasing. But it does increase. It has increased. So would that effect. bring the millage rate down? It would if uh, we're not oh, generating. It would if we're not generating uh, new uh, new uh, tax dollars, or, or if, a, if the budget doesn't increase. If the budget stays the same. Um, then yes, you're essentially correct. The tax rate would stay flat, or, or could potentially go down as new value comes on. Um, but if you look historically at the last several budgets, um, the amount raised um, through property taxes has substantially increased. This year it was 186 million dollars needed. The year before last it was uh, 177 million dollars needed. Um, so just in one year, uh, the budget increased uh, substantially. That's why it was one of the reasons why the council put a put a four percent increase um, uh, in the uh, uh, to, in, in our taxes. That's why our millage rate went from twenty two dollars and forty eight cents last year to twenty three dollars and thirty one cents. And what about revenue sharing from the state? Uh, we have we got kind of slammed by y'all, and you didn't like us. Is that going to change? <laughs> so revenue sharing has uh, changed. Uh, Portland's uh, seeing a uh, uh, substantial increase in its revenue sharing. That'll be discussed in the budget process when those numbers uh, come to light. Um, so what the state does with each municipality every year, the state does their own um, sales analysis based on the sales that happen in the jurisdiction. And the state, for each municipality, comes up with what they call the state equalized valuation. And it's that number. It's not the municipality's actual taxable value. It's what the state says your taxable value should be. That's the number um, that determines revenue sharing, what your education subsidy is going to be. Um, that number has, uh, is used in a lot of different formulas to determine um, uh, revenue sharing. Um, and that, as that value goes up, um, value goes up, the revenue sharing and the, and the education subsidy comes comes down as that, as that value goes up. Yes. How did the commercial end of this work out, or how is it working out? Uh, so, so as a as a as a ratio, um, right. uh, commercial overall as a ratio is fifty nine percent. That that's what our the, the commercial re uh, revaluation. The, the, the project manager doing the commercial side of the, mm -hmm. of the revaluation. He presented this um, earlier this month to commercial property owners, and his statistical testing, or the statistical test, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. 50, 59% in that uh, statistical testing for the commercial. 59% uh, assessment to market, market value. Mm -hmm. So yes. it means overall they're doing up more, uh, possibly more than the residential. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. And that overall will make the, the value of the city go up on your on your state funding also? It would correct. Yes. Is the house in my neighborhood that's for sale and it's for sale approximately three hundred thousand dollars more than what it sold for three years ago. Do we know why? Did, I, have they made I, have they made improvements? Have they done any work? I, I don't know why, but does that impact well, now we would, so when that sale comes through, whatever the final sale price is on that, we would review that sale to see does it meet those five criteria to be listed on our sales ratio study for an arm's length transaction. Um, and we would determine why, why, why did it sell for that much. Yes, sir. And, and this is a mass appraisal, not an individual fee appraisal. So uh, we realize that people get good deals and some people overpay for their property. What we're looking at is the median. Okay. We're not we're not looking for the top end. So it wouldn't necessarily right. Be that. And, and you could ask anything you want for a property. It's hopefully it, yes. Uh, hope, uh, hopefully a uh, informed buyer um, uh, will set the the value of that property. And it's not. Uh, and we have a saying in the mass appraisal business. Okay, one sale doesn't equal a market. We consider all the sales. Uh, so we're, even if there's only one sale on your street, we're going to go to other areas around your house uh, to, to consider um, a, a true value, what we would call it. Market value is very different than cost <coughs> or sale price.
Yes. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about uh, undue stimulus and how you can how you determine whether something is truly impacting the value of the property, something in the environment, something that's you know nearby? Um, so, do you have any specific uh, example to? Uh, well, to, to, to base side, so despite a lot of speculation, but you know, um, it's it's property values going to the roof. You know, there are there are a lot of factors that are influencing those values, um, and so how would you determine whether the proximity to some of those areas is so so, so some areas of measure in that regard um, certainly am I impacted because there's uh, you know, social services uh, down the street. Uh, sometimes those things don't come out in a sales uh, sales ratio study. Sometimes we have to use um, our best judgment. Um, to determine what is a fair depreciation uh, to, to apply to maybe these couple of blocks or, or to, a, to a particular segment. Um, there's no real, we're not going to open up the Marshall and Swift value guide and says, oh, you live in this proximity to, here's what an appropriate rate of depreciation is. We really do look at, uh, at, at values of similar properties that have sold nearby to determine, um, to, to extract out what an appropriate depreciation would be. And that's sort of a unique area in that way because. <laughs> Opposite issue in Montreal Hill, we have very few residential homes. In fact, I think, I think there's like about 20 single family homes, and there's not a lot of uh, one to one comparison. Right. Yeah. And, 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 so, and, so and, and a mass appraisal. Again, we, we make models and we apply those models over a large group of homes. Um, and if you think that there's something with your property that isn't valued correctly or something should be considered, that's why we. we Ask you, we implore you, please come in to an informal appeal and tell us about it. We, we want to hear. I don't actually know that. When you're saying, um, you know, if you think yours is, is different to other people's increases or decreases, um, how do you actually determine that at home receiving your own? How do you compare that to what other changes have happened? So assessed values are uh, everybody's assessed value so is is it, um, well everybody's assessed value is, is public information. It's part of the tax roll. Uh, it's on the city website um, for a property search. You you can certainly so look at the, yeah, exactly. You can certainly look at other properties to determine are you being assessed um, uh, equitably um, in relation to to other properties. Um, the uh, state law um, essentially says that if um, uh, if we're within ten percent of of your, uh, of your market value, um, that it is, um, that essentially, um, uh, it's, it's a valid assessment. If, 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 we're, if your assessment is within 10% of its market value, it's, it's a valid, valid assessment. The other the question I have is, I'm, I am a part of the home owner of 1884 house that has one of those little pass-through rooms. Yeah. Um, and so on the uh, daily mailer, it just has three bedrooms. Correct. So you don't necessarily know that your depreciate a lot of your depreciation is coming from the fact 18 years. For sure, yeah. Like, yeah, but it doesn't specify you know when you have a hallway whether that's when you pass or just three bedrooms. So you know I just know that it is okay because that's three bedrooms. But is that something that we would correct? If it's worth correcting. We would if yeah, if, 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 if we were if we could, we would certainly correct that if we had that information. And we would consider uh, is it. Yeah, we would consider. Yeah, the but the I is. You, at this point, you have to do it through a hearing, though, not necessarily saying, "Hey, I." Well, well, uh, it, uh, I would say uh, uh, when you get your notice, uh, uh, see if you think it's a, uh, a fair assessment compared to uh, other houses in your neighborhood. Maybe it is, but if it isn't, give us a call. Yeah, I, yeah, I, still, I still think it's, it's going to be hard to determine that based on surrounding factors, but yeah, we'll, we'll see. But, uh, a lot of nuances in the mass appraisal. It's not like we're coming out to your property to, to, to do a, a single appraisal. You talked about outside influences. Um, I know a lot of neighborhoods have been influenced by Rock Row and all the noises. I mean, hopefully it's going to be taken care of, but you know, it's been quite an issue. Does that impact any of this? Uh, again, we would, the only way to determine that is do we see a substantial drop in market values from pre Rock Row to post Rock Row? I don't know that we're going to see that. <laughs> Uh, cost approach in the case of like new construction or renovation, if, if you 
you give a value of uh, say five hundred thousand. I come in with all my receipts and say, well, I built this for two hundred fifty thousand. How much do you actually weigh that? And uh, uh, so certainly every situation is unique. It is something that uh, we would certainly consider it. Um, I don't know without looking specifically what the term what determination would be made, um, but we would certainly consider anything that you would bring in. And, uh, and Yes. When is it too late to sort of appeal maybe the information that's come back on the audit for your property? Because at this point in time, I know that some of the records that came back for me are not correct, but I also realize that after the deadline on the printed piece, I'd get back to you. So, is there so anything? So, if you haven't set your data mailer in yet, um, we still plenty of time. Um, we, we are actively going through, again, almost 11,000. Uh, that were returned to us and we're making changes. If you have yet to send it in, get it to us. Please send it to us. Um, there is no time where it would be uh, too late. Um, if you sent that to us after you got your new value notice, we would make those changes if you didn't get your data in mail or in and there were changes uh, if we needed to correct inaccuracies in your, in your property record. Um, after you got your tax bill, if you brought it to our attention that we have incorrect data um, on your property that may affect value. We would certainly take a look at that, and, and, and if adjustment was warranted, we would make, we would make that adjustment.